Then we're going to move on. We'll talk about viruses, but we'll also, towards the end, talk about um, prions. So we're almost, let's see, your viruses, you guys, it's like, it's like the third unit from the end of the whole course. So we're almost there. All right? So what we'll do, folks, again, we're going to um, finish up our microbial genetics part two PowerPoint. And there's a, a, there's a uh, slide here, you guys, that has a question from the textbook publisher. And that is um, in discussing different strains of E. coli. You might recall that um, um, in our lab exam two um, study guide homework packet, there was a discussion of serotyping and how we can use antibodies against the flagellar antigens or the O polysaccharides or lipopolysaccharides to identify specific strains, for example, of E. coli. And we were mentioning the specific serotype, E. coli 0157H7, is a very serious pathogen because it carries a gene for a powerful toxin called shigatoxin. And shigatoxin, you guys, what happens is it shuts down ADS ribosome function, so it shuts down translation protein synthesis in our cells. Transmission of E. coli 0157H7, it's fecal orally. Um, it can be found in the feces of cattle, of humans, of... Um, um, even wild animals like wild pigs. So wherever the feces goes, the E. coli 0157A7 goes. So if that feces contaminates food or drinking water and then we ingest it, we can get infected. And we're really worried, you guys, about our children because this can be a very serious infection in children. If our children get colonized with 0157H7, the shiga toxin is absorbed into the bloodstream. It causes blood vessel damage. And so one of the clinical signs is a bloody diarrhea. And you guys, if, if um, your child or friend's children develop a bloody diarrhea, I would consider it a possible medical emergency and take them right to the hospital and tell them you're worried about, you know, the sugar toxin-producing E. coli. And the reason is not only will, will it cause this bloody diarrhea, but because it causes blood vessel damage, red blood cells will start lysing, so you have hemolysis, and that can result in a hemolytic anemia. And furthermore, the toxin can travel to the kidneys and cause damage to those delicate capillaries in the kidneys, causing kidney damage, right? So we have multiple problems going on at the same time, so we refer to this as a syndrome. So the E. coli 0157E7, folks, it causes the syndrome known as hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS, and again, you guys, HUS stands for hemolytic because the red blood cells are lysing, causing an anemia, anemia. uremic because we have excess blood urea. It's, that's one signal that your kidneys aren't working well. Hemolytic uremic syndrome because more than one thing is going wrong. And again, folks, this can be fatal in children, or it can cause some permanent um, damage. So again, folks, if ever you see you know, children with with red blood in their, um, in their feces, I would go get it checked out immediately, right? Um, we have this pathogen here in California. Historically, it was known as hamburger disease because cattle could carry it. When the cattle are slaughtered, their carcasses get contaminated with feces, right? And then the meat, the outside of the meat can get contaminated with feces. So if we don't cook our, our beef properly, or especially, guys, when we grind up meat, the fecal pathogens get um, moved inside, say, a hamburger patty. So if you don't cook the ground meat, the hamburger, all the way through, the fecal bacteria inside will still be alive. So initially, it was associated with undercooked hamburgers or contaminated hamburgers. Um, but then in the last decades, it's becoming a contaminant of, like, salad greens, like um, spinach. We had an outbreak of spinach here in California. And the reason we worry about salads is we often don't cook those, right? We eat them raw, right? So you guys, the E. coli 0157H7, like most of the fecal pathogen, they're really sensitive to heat. Cooking will destroy them. It's just that if the cooked product isn't cooked thoroughly, like ground meat, or if it gets contaminated after cooking, or if we're eating um, fresh fruits or vegetables that have been contaminated with feces. So why are we talking about this? Because prior to about World War II, this strain of E. coli wasn't a pathogen. It didn't, it didn't make a toxin. So the question is, how did E. coli 0157H7 acquire the shigatoxin gene, right? So guess what? It got it from its close relative called Shigella dysenteria. And Shigella dysenteria, you guys, it belongs to the same family of... <coughs> 
bacteria, as does E. coli. It belongs to that big gram-negative enterobacteria ACA family. So they're cousins, right? And Shigella dysenteria, it is the, it, I guess we could say it was the originator of the Shiga toxin gene. And this pathogen, again, fecal oral transmission, it causes bacillary dysentery. That's the name of the infectious disease that it causes. And so what we now know, folks, is, is um, how did E. coli acquire the Shiga toxin gene? It was through horizontal gene transfer. And we now know it was through transduction. And you guys, what is, just as a quiz, what is transduction? If we're talking about horizontal gene transfer, who or what carried the Shiga toxin gene from Shigella to E. coli O157H7? Do you remember transduction? And you guys, remember, it's good to guess. They've shown that if, you're, if you actively guess, even if you're wrong, you learn the information better. So you guys, let me give you some choices. Was it con... Um, was it um, uptake of naked DNA by a competent bacterium? Is that what transduction is? Nope, that's transformation, right? Was it transfer of donor DNA to a recipient bacterium by cell-to-cell -cell contact? Yes. Close. Okay, that is called conjugation, right? In transduction, the donor is dead. So how is the donor DNA getting to the recipient? Bacteriophage, awesome, you guys. So it was a little bacteria virus, also known as a bacteriophage. They carry the donor DNA, carrying the Shiga toxin gene to E. coli and injected, injected the E. coli with the Shiga toxin gene. And then we'll talk about how it got incorporated into the chromosome. So you guys, so this is just an example of why we worry about this horizontal gene transfer, especially amongst our um, pathogens of medical importance, right? This is a way for them to share virulence genes, to share toxin genes. It's a way for them to share antibiotic resistance genes, right? So really kind of important um, application in the real world. Okay, good. So you guys, if I ask you how did E. coli acquire the Shiga toxin gene, what are you going to tell me? Transduction, right? And specifically, what does that mean? Delivery of the donor Shiga toxin gene by a bacterial virus or bacteriophage. Awesome. Good job, you guys. Great. So you guys, just a couple more topics to, to finish up here. I'm trying to make sure I can do this. Okay. So we'll use the PowerPoint slides. And you guys, let me just, for the movie, let me just give you, we are now on PowerPoint slide 27 and the microbial genetics PowerPoint part two. So you guys, just few topics here. We're going to remind ourselves what are plasmids. We talked about plasmids way back, talking about bacteria cell structures. Do you remember what plasmids are? Ooh, that was good. I like that, you guys. So circular DNA found in bacteria and other organisms are, is, this, is the circular DNA, you guys, part of the chromosome or is it outside the chromosome? It's outside the chromosome, right? They're almost like little mini chromosomes. So you guys, so we're going to focus on plasmids of um, bacteria. So you guys, if we were to cartoon, let's say this is our, bact our generic bacterium. And we'll use a blue circle, you guys, for the, the chromosome. So plasmids, some bacteria have plasmids, others don't. But plasmids, you guys, they're just like a chromosome. They're circular, double-stranded DNA. And they're described as extra chromosomal DNA, meaning they're not part of the, they're not part of the chromosome. They're outside the chromosome. And we we ask ourselves, well, why? You know, why is the why the guy, little guy have a, a plasmid? So usually they're carrying. Um, extra genetic information, um, genes that will help them survive in different environments. So you guys, if our plasmid was carrying antibiotic resistance genes, what would we call the plasmid? So um, we name the plasmids often depending on what kind of genes they're, they're carrying. So you guys, if you had, if you isolated a bacterial plasmid, and you discovered it was carrying genes for antibiotic resistance, what kind of a plasmid would you call it? 
Yeah, good. We would call it an, a resistance plasmid, right? And because we're biologists, we get lazy and we just call them R plasmids. Okay, so again, folks, this is of concern because plasmids can carry um, genes for one, two, three, four, five, or six different antibiotics. And the reason we're so worried, not only does you know, this bacterium carry all those antibiotic resistance genes, but through horizontal gene transfer, could this bacterium pass copies of that R plasma to neighbors, right? And then boom, they become resistant to multiple antibiotics. Now the nightmare scenario, guys, is if we take a, let me see where's our point here, okay. So if we take a antibiotic resistance plasmid, folks, excuse me, and we put it on a plasmid that's known as a conjugated plasmid. And folks, don't worry about dissimilation plasmids. We're not going to talk about those. But what we now want to do is talk about, this is a nightmare base, is a conjugative R plasmid. This is a nightmare for us humans. So the R means what, folks? Genes for resistance to antibiotics, or in addition, folks, often they carry genes for resistance to heavy metals. Because remember, back in the old days, heavy metals like mercury and silver were used as antimicrobials, so bacteria will have, can also carry resistance to heavy metal genes. Okay. But a conjugated plasmid, you guys, this is a nightmare. Let me, let me advance one so we can see one. So not only does the plasmid, so this will be our little plasmid here, Okay, so here's our plasmid, our circular plasmid. So it'll have um, antibiotic resistance genes. And I'll just put a couple in here, you guys. But in addition to make it a conjugated plasmid, it has the genes to carry out conjugation. And an example, you guys, would be the F factor of E. coli. Remember that F factor? The F plasmid, right, that had the genes to make the sex pillars and had the genes for the... Um, the protein hypodermic syringe and needle that could inject the recipient with a copy of um, genetic information. So we're going to have the conjugation genes on the same plasmid. And why this is so, so scary is, is that means that this donor bacterium can make copies of the conjugate of our plasmid, pass them to multiple neighbors, and then they're going to become um, they're going to become donors able to transfer that conjugate of R plasmid to other neighbors. So you can see how this would cause rapid spread of these mul multiple antibiotic resistant um, plasmids through a population of microbes. So this is really bad news. So you guys, here's, here is an example of a conjugate of R plasmid. So again, just so we understand. So, um, so MER, you guys, this is the gene for mercury resistance, right? A heavy metal resistance. SUL is the gene for sulfa drug resistance. STR is the gene for streptomycin resistance, one of the immunoglycosides. CML is the gene for chloramphenicol resistance. What do you think TET is for? Tetracycline. Good. So you guys, how many, how many antimicrobials does this plasmid provide resistance to? Let's go ahead and include the heavy metal mercury. So one, two, three, four, five, five, five genes for resistance against five different antimicrobial. And what makes it worse, folks, is here are the conjugation genes, the genes for the conjugation pillars, and the genes to transfer copies of the R plasmid to neighbors, right? So bad news. And so now we're starting to understand how is it that these antibiotic resistance genes can be transferred, spread through populations of microbes so rapidly, right? So very efficient. Very, very efficient. Does it transfer like one at a time, like one bacteria? The whole plasmid. It's a copy of the whole plasmid. So remember in conjugation, the donor is is transferring a copy of DNA to the recipient. And it would be a copy of the whole plasmid, yeah. And then that recipient becomes a donor, right? So it's just like, it's exponential. It's like a, yeah, it's not good for us humans, that's for sure. Okay, all right, you okay, guys, so. And then, and then folks, the, the last, uh, or second to last little tidbit we're gonna talk about is if our plasmids aren't bad enough, 
There's another DNA um, segment, special DNA sequence called the transposon. And just a little bit of history uh, behind this, you guys. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> a little bit of history behind this <coughs> is <coughs> back in the, I think, pretty early 1900s. I want to say 1920. I don't know. That might be a little bit too early. But back in the, um, the early 1900s, back at Cornell University, there was a, um, a plant geneticist by the name of Barbara McClintock. And Barbara McClintock was trying to figure out how the genes for um, corn pigment got passed. So have you guys seen the beautiful multicolored corn? Multicolored corn. I was going to bring some in, and I forgot to bring it. But it's just beautiful. Sometimes you see it this time of the year in fall. Um, so on one, one um, cob, there'll be blue kernels and yellow kernels and white kernels, um, red kernels. It's beautiful, just gorgeous. And what Barbara McClintock was trying to figure out, she was trying to figure out the rules for the kernel pigment inheritance, you know, from mom and dad corn to the baby corn, and then they grow up, and what kind of colored corn do they make? And it was not making any sense to her. Um, and, and the reason this is such an endearing story, you guys, is Cornell is where I did my graduate work. And I actually got to walk in her cornfields. Right? It's, so, it's just wonderful. They made this beautiful garden out. OK, anyway. So like a lot of scientists that are studying something, they become really intimately invested in that world. So the, the field house in which Barbara McClintock slept and ate and studied her corn plants is still there. They say that the corn plants were like her children or grandchildren. She knew the parents, she knew the children, she knew the grandchildren of all these generations of corn plants. So she was really absorbed and could not for the life of her figure out how these, um, the, the pigment genes were being passed from one generation to the next. It wasn't like classical Mendelian genetics. And so you guys, just like Frederick Griffith, she had the prepared mind to come up with a hypothesis that pushed our understanding, kind of the, the envelope of our understanding, she came up with a hypothesis that the only way this inheritance would make sense is if there were so-called jumping genes. Genes that could actually move, jump from one place on the chromosome to another, right? And when they would jump into one gene, they might knock out pigment production. But in the next generation, the transposon might jump out of that gene and jump into another gene, right? So we turn on, say, red pigment, turn off blue pigment, right? And what do you think people thought about her? You are crazy. You're spending too much time in the cornfield. You need to get a life, right? Everybody laughed at her, laughed at her, said, you are crazy, right? But you guys, as happens lots of times when people come up with new ideas, you know, sometimes they turn out to be right. Yeah. So, and I think indeed, you guys, she did get a Nobel Prize for this because it was subsequently found other people did investigations with other organisms and found out, by, by golly, she was right. So these jumping genes, they can move from one place on a chromosome to another. You guys, it's amazing. They can jump from a chromosome into a plasmid. They can jump from a plasmid back into the chromosome, right? The official names, these are called transposons. And you might say, well, OK, that, you know, that, so what? Who cares? Well, guess what transposons can carry? Here's a transposon, you guys. TN is for transposon, and they have different numbers. What is this transposon carrying? <coughs> Canamycin resistance gene. So this is for another aminoglycoside. So again, you guys, this is the bad news. These transposons, they can, they may carry antibiotic resistance genes. And just to make it worse, they can be conjugative plasmids. Okay, so they can carry antibiotic, oops, sorry, resistance genes and or conjugation genes. So, so the result, you guys, would be the same if you have 
a conjugative R transpose on. What am I talking about, you guys? If I put conjugative R transpose on on the exam, what do I mean, conjugative? What is that talking about? Carries the genes that lets the, the um, host bacterium carry out what process? Conjugation, good, okay? And what does the R mean? Resistant genes, either antibiotics or heavy metals or both, right? So you guys, this is another way where antibiotic resistant genes could be rapidly spread through a population of um, bacteria, right? Because now with the conjugative genes, the donor bacterium conjugating with the recipient, passing a copy of the conjugative R transpose on to the recipient, then that recipient becomes a donor and keeps spreading the genes around. So again, you guys, we're just, we really now understand how many different ways bacteria have to share their antibiotic resistant genes. And that's, that's why we're in the pickle we're in, right? Is that we didn't realize how promiscuous bacteria are and how rapidly they can spread those antibiotic resistant genes. Okay, but you guys, as evolutionary biologists, what can we humans do to, to reduce the spread and selection for antibiotic resistant bacteria? What, what can we do? We can cut back the inappropriate use of antibiotics. And you guys, have I give you, given you my soapbox opera on antibiotics added to animal feeds as growth promoters? Have I given you that so far? Say yes, so I won't go into it, right? Mm -hmm. But you guys, um, since World War II, it was discovered that if you add low, 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 low concentration of antibiotics to animal feed, the animals will gain more weight more rapidly. They'll, if it's dairy cows, they'll make more milk. If it's chickens, they'll lay more eggs. Um, if it's beef or pigs or poultry, they'll gain more weight per pound of feed that you give them, right? And so everybody started adding antibiotics to their animal feeds as growth promoters. But you guys, as evolutionary biologists, why is that such a bad idea? How are we changing the environment? We're saturating it with antibiotics. So who, who's going to survive? Who are we selecting for? The antibiotic-resistant bacteria, right? You guys, and this, is, this to me is really important, you guys. If you're carrying antibiotic resistance genes, it's a little burden, right? Because you have to invest um, resources and energy to copy those antibiotic resistance genes, right? So we could argue if there's no antibiotic, if there's no antibiotics in the environment, right? You maybe are at a little disadvantage. You're wasting your time, right? But if we add antibiotics to the environment, suddenly. If you have those antibiotic resistance genes, now you're the survivor and all of your antibiotic sensitive neighbors are going to be killed, right? So again, you guys, that's one place and we're making progress cutting back on the antibiotics that we add to our animal feeds. There's a movement, slowly, 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 a movement going on to try to eventually outlaw adding antibiotics to animal feeds as growth promoters. So we're making progress, you guys, and it helps when the public understands because then they will support support these um, future laws that will try to reduce the use of antibiotics. And that's going to have a big impact, you guys. That's going to really reduce the spread of antibiotic resistance. Yeah. Okay, good, good job. Okay. Um, so you guys, do you remember that when we talk about mutations and we talk about horizontal gene transfer is is – Evolutionary biologists, we know these are all really important for a bacteria because it helps increase their genetic diversity, right? So that's really important for the bacteria. And we remember, we need a lot of genetic diversity so that some of those variants will have just the right combinations of genes to survive. So bacteria or humans, we need that genetic diversity, right? Uh, okay. Uh, natural selection, environment favors, from where does diversity in genetic... So you guys, in bacteria, where does the genetic diversity come from? Mutations, right? That's probably the origin. And then bacteria can also do what to increase their genetic diversity? Yeah, here, have a gene, right? Horizontal gene transfer. Good job, you guys. Okay, right, right, right. Okay, and hopefully, okay, so you guys, so what we're going to end with then, we, we talk a lot about antibiotic resistance, 
So for lecture exam three, you guys, I'd like you to know exactly what these mechanisms are. You know, how is it that bacteria can resist antibiotics? So I'm going to use this little table, you guys, and this will also become a topic of discussion next week when we start doing our antibiotic sensitivity tests, right? We're going to be testing like three different bacteria, and we're going to see some of them are resistant to the antibiotics we're using, and we want to know why. How is it? How is that happening, right? So you guys, so this little table, kind of a concept map. So um, one example, folks, is where the cell wall would prevent entry of the antibiotic. Can you give an example where the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria would prevent entry of a specific antibiotic we've discussed? Penicillin, good. Good job, you guys. Remember we said penicillin usually can't cross through the outer membrane porins of most gram-negatives, right? So that gram-negative cell wall prevents the passage of uh, penicillin in most cases. Good, good job. What about acid fast bacteria? Do you think their cell wall is protective? Very protective, right? That hydrophobic waxy cell wall. It's not a cell wall, you guys, but let's think about bacterial endospores. Do you think bacterial endospores will let antibiotics pass? Nope. Right, good. Okay, and then number two, you guys, in activating enzymes, can you think of talking about penicillin, ampicillin, and amoxicillin? Can you think of a bacterial enzyme that destroys penicillin, ampicillin, amoxicillin? Beta-lactamase, awesome, you guys. And folks, uh, in lab, um, when we get our antibiotic sensitivity test results, we'll also discuss that bacteria can have enzymes that will chemically modify an antibiotic, like add a, a methyl group, a functional group, so the antibiotic can no longer bind to its target. So there's, there's different classes of bacterial enzymes that can inactivate our antibiotics. Two, three, alteration of target molecule. You guys remember when we talked about MRSA? Why are MRSA resistant to all of our beta lactams? <laughs> exactly, mute transpeptidase, right? So if you have a mutation of the target, so the antibiotic can no longer bind, boom, that bacterium is antibiotic resistant, good. And you guys, to me, this is like the scariest thing, these efflux pumps. This to me is like science fiction, but it's true. So bacteria can um, um, acquire genes or evolve genes for protein pumps in the cytoplasmic membrane that pump out antibiotics. Efflux, pump them out, right? And the, the troubling thing is sometimes these pumps are nonspecific, meaning they can pump out more than one type of antibiotic. And, and again, you guys, this, this kind of tie into lab, but very troubling was when the first kind of um, antimicrobial craze went through our um, society. Do you guys remember when everything had antimicrobials in it? You know, toys, cutting, cutting boards, Socks, you know, everyone was like, everything has to be antimicrobial. And one of the first really popular antimicrobials was called triclosan, triclosan. And it was getting incorporated into everything. And there were microbiologists that were warning what? What, what do us humans love to do? Do we love to overuse antimicrobials, right? And so what? Who cares? Why are we concerned? Overuse selects for what? For right, for resistant bacteria. And you guys, what's so scary about this is that one of the mechanisms of resistance was a efflux pump. And not only would it pump out the triclosan, it was nonspecific. It's pumping out antibiotics, other antibiotics, right? So this is why, you guys, we just have to be so careful. Right? So by overusing the triclosan, we selected for resistant bacteria that had a pump that could pump out the triclosan. But what else did they pump out? Not just triclosan, but what else? And, um, I would say, uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and antibiotics. 
So that's bad use, right? So if we're overusing it in our household, oh, they, they put it in hand soap. They like to put it in hand soap. So if we're overusing triclosan, not only are we selecting for bacteria resistant to triclosan, right? We're co-selecting for antibiotic resistance. Yeah, so we just we have to be so careful, you guys. And the antimicrobial hand soap, you guys, again, you know, I, you know I'm an old fart, right? But truly, if you can, if you have access to soap and water, use that to physically remove pathogens from your hands or you know, whatever instruments you're, you're using, as long as you're not doing surgery, right? Because with good old soap and water, you're not going to select for resistance. You're physically washing the pathogens down the drain. So good old soap and water, you guys, if you can, go for that, right? If it's not a dangerous situation. All right, so you guys, we okay with finally, finally, oh, you guys, these last two slides, I just put these in here because whenever your colleagues take the T's test, I always ask them, you know, what was on the test? Um, so I think most of this you're okay with, but one thing we didn't talk about, folks, is genotype and phenotype, and this came up on the T's test one time. So the genotype is the genetic information of the cell, right? And the phenotype is the expression of that genetic information. So I know this is silly, you guys. So let's say I've got the genes for blue-green eyes, right? So the phenotype of, of those genes are my blue-green eyes, right? If the, uh, if the genotype of a bacterium is it's carrying an ampicillin resistance gene, the phenotype is it is ampicillin resistant. Does, does this make sense? Okay, so again, you guys, I just threw that in there. I never ask you about genotype and phenotype on the exam, but it was on the T's test, so I wanted you to, to feel comfortable with those two terms because we want you to rock those exams. Okay, so you guys, we're going to leave um, microbial genetics now, and we're, it, that's actually forming a great basis for this next unit, Unit 7 on viruses. Okay, so we're going to start looking at viruses. And you guys, it's so fascinating to me. For some reason, when um, I was in undergrad and grad school, for some reason I just really was drawn to bacteria and bacterial pathogens. For some reason I didn't like viruses. They didn't seem too, for, too fuzzy and warm. I don't know why. But the more I've learned about viruses, the more I've learned to really, really um, not enjoy. That wouldn't be the right term but to, to be really fascinated by them. And, and I think part of it is the older I get, I, I like things that break rules, right? Yeah, an aged hippie here, right? Radical. But viruses, what do they love to do? They love to break all of our rules. And I just find that really humbling and cool. Yeah, okay, so I like viruses because they like to break our rules. And indeed, you guys, way back when, when viruses were first um, discovered, after we finally had electron microscopes and we could visualize them, one of the early virologists, when a journalist was interviewing him, said, you know, can you please explain what a virus is to the public? And this is the best description, you guys. The virologist said, a virus is trouble wrapped in protein. I'm like, that is so true. So you guys, just so we have a little cartoon of this virus, trouble wrapped in protein. Okay, this will be a little, a little brief appetizer on viral structure. So you guys, are viruses made of cells? Nope, they're not made of cells, right? So our virus, so the simplest virus, you guys, it has a protein coat or shell. So this is the protein coat, and it has a fancy name. It's called the capsid. Okay, so when he says trouble wrapped in protein, this is the protein wrapper. And the trouble is, the trouble is the viral genetic information. This is the trouble the virologist was talking about. And you guys, viral genetic information, information is it always going to be DNA? No. no. What, what are the two groups of viruses based on genetic information? Yeah, either, yeah, good job you guys, either DNA or what? RNA, RNA. good. Okay, but that, DNA or RNA, that is encoding the viral trouble. They're going to make trouble for the cells that they invade. Okay, so you guys will do a little bit of history, and then we'll talk about structures. So you guys, so viruses historically have caused so much heartbreak for humans, 
And, and remember, you guys, it wasn't until relatively recently we even knew what they were. So if you can imagine horrible epidemics of smallpox and influenza killing thousands, millions, and nobody knows what's causing it, right? Nobody knows what's causing it, right? So that added to the fear. We didn't know how to control the spread, right? So a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. It was as early as the 1800s when it was known that bacteria could cause disease, that some scientists hypothesized, made an educated guess, that there could be some pathogens smaller than bacteria, but they just didn't know what they were, right? Just, just an idea. And then, folks, it was in Russia in the late 1800s that a fantastic scientist by the na name of Dmitry Ivanovsky did this awesome experiment. And so, you guys, I want to take time to kind of walk through his experiment because, again, this shows the prepared mind, somebody that was willing to think outside the box, right, and really expand our understanding of our world. So, folks, um, Ivanovsky was working with a plant. Um, aha. So Ivanovsky was trying to figure out what was call it causing a, an inf a, a disease of tobacco plants. So this was um, a disease of tobacco plants. And tobacco, you, folks, you know, it's um, historically, it's um, an economically important crop, right, to grow and sell tobacco. So if your tobacco plants got diseased, right, if you're a tobacco farmer, that could be pretty devastating for you. So this disease was called tobacco mosaic disease. And the reason is that when the plants become ill, when they become sick, instead of having a nice uniform green color, so here's a healthy tobacco leaf, right, nice, nice green, the diseased tobacco plants develop these little yellow dots, almost like little mosaic, yellow mosaic tiles in this green route background, right? And the, then the plant dies. And so economically, this was, you know, really important. Um, and, and scientifically, it was really important to try to figure out, well, is it a pathogen that's causing this disease, right? So what um, Ivanovsky did is he took... Um, he took a disease plant, so this is our disease leaf, right, with the little dot, dot, dots in it, right? And then instead of using a guinea pig, he used a healthy tobacco plant. So this is our healthy tobacco plant. That's going to be the guinea pig. And what Ivan Askew was trying to figure out, is it an infectious disease agent? Is, is it a microbe, right? So, and he was trying to figure out the identity. So what he did, he took the disease plant, he, um, he ground it up, you know, maybe add some sterile saline to make a gamish. So this, this will be our gamish, you guys. Gamish, how do you spell gamish? I'm not sure. A mixture of diseased plants, right? Presumingly, the pathogen's going to be in there, right, if it's, if it's an infectious disease. And the cool thing was, you guys, and this is not how they actually look, but we're going to pretend these are these cool porcelain filters developed by the people in the Pasteur Institute in Paris, France. And these porcelain filters, you guys, they had tiny, tiny pores. And the pores were so tiny that they would, um, wouldn't permit bacteria to pass through them, right? So, okay, so there's our filter. We're going to put our, our mix of diseased leaves into the filter. So here's our diseased leaf mix. And the idea was, you guys, is that if the tobacco mosaic disease was being caused by bacterium, so let me make these great big bacteria, you guys. So these, these are bacteria. Remember, the pores are so small, the bacteria can't sneak through, right? So you guys, what do you know then about the filtrate? The filtrate, would there be any bacteria in it? No, right? So this is really cool. No bacteria. 
So the hypothesis was, and you guys remember, hypothesis educated guess. Let's just we'll just pretend. Hypothesis number one: bacteria cause tobacco mosaic disease. Okay, so let's start with that hypothesis, you guys. All right. So to test the hypothesis, we're going to take this filtrate. Are there any bacteria in it? No bacteria. And we're going to use it to inoculate a healthy plant. So bacteria-free filtrate used to inoculate healthy plant. So you guys, if our hypothesis is true, what's your prediction? If our hypothesis is true that tobacco mosaic disease is caused by bacteria, right, and we use our bacteria-free filtrate to inoculate this healthy plant, if it's true that bacteria cause the disease, would you predict this healthy plant should get sick or not sick? Okay, prediction, the healthy plant should not get um, disease, right? That's your prediction. So then you run your experiment, you guys, and you look at your results. And guess what happened? Yeah, the actual results were what? Yeah. Plant became diseased. Wow. That was crazy. Right? Because at this time, you know, most people thought bacteria were the smallest um, pathogens, right? So it's like, how could something that didn't have bacteria be, you know, transmit this disease? So you guys, so the reason Ivan Ousky was so brilliant was he said, okay, um, my original hypothesis must be wrong, right? My results didn't, didn't support it, so the original hypothesis was wrong, right? Because the results, you know, didn't support the prediction. So here was where Ivanowski was brilliant. So he came up with this concept that the pathogen causing tobacco mosaic disease must be smaller than a bacterium, right? And you guys are like, well, of course. But this was a big stuff back then, you guys. This is big stuff. So this was our hypothesis, or Ivanowski's hypothesis, his revised hypothesis. And that's what science is all about, you guys, doing experiments, getting the results seeing if it supports or doesn't support your hypothesis, coming up with a new hypothesis. So hypothesis number two, you guys, what was hypothesis number two? Something smaller than bacteria? Something smaller. Some, remember, you guys, something. What is it we don't know? Something smaller than bacteria cause tobacco mosaic disease. Does that make sense, folks? Okay. All right. So Ivanowski was the first person to prove that there was a microbial pathogen smaller than bacteria that at least could cause plant disease, right? That was a big step, you guys. And as always in science, you guys, we always want, if we have cool experiments with cool results, we always want it to be repeated by somebody else. And this was what was so awesome, you guys. So <clears throat> only a few years later, a Dutch botanist um, Martinez by Jaring. He repeated Ivanowski's experiment and he got the exact same results. The exact same results. So it was repeatable. And it was by Jaring, you guys, that first came up for this something smaller than a bacterium. He was the first person to use the term virus. So he called that something a filterable virus. Filterable smaller than a bacterium can cause disease. So virus comes from, from the Latin for poison. And Vigerian described it as contagious living fluid. Don't know what those viruses are, but at least we have a name for them now, right? <clears throat> and then, folks, we're going to fast forward to World War I, which was 1914 to 1918. Horrible war, right, um, in Europe. And you guys, back in World War I, they were still using cavalry in battle. What's cavalry? Your soldiers are going into battle riding what? Horses, right? And so you can imagine, folks, that if you were in the cavalry and you were about to go into battle riding your horse and you develop a horrible diarrheal disease, 
Do you think that might lower your fighting ability? Yeah. Not only you, but all your colleagues have diarrhea, right? So, and, and you guys have probably heard this, so many battles or wars have been won not through weapons, but through infectious disease. And this was really true right back in the day. So we had this big outbreak of diarrheal, diarrheal disease dysentery in the cavalry that was stationed outside of Paris. There was a Canadian uh, microbiologist, and just like you guys would do, you're trying to figure out what's causing the diarrhea. So you're going to take samples of feces, and what are you going to do? Inoculate your auger plates, right? I mean, you guys could do this. But what was fascinating, again, you guys, here's somebody with a prepared mind to think outside the box. Um, you know, feces has a lot of bacteria in it, right? So we're going to see next week, you guys, if we swab the surface of a plate with lots of bacteria, all the bacteria grow together, making what's called a lawn. It's called confluent growth. All the colonies are touching one another. So it's almost like you're frosting the surface of the auger plate, right? And so with some of the diarrheal specimens, it makes sense that he had just this lawn of bacteria on the plate. But what did he do, you guys? He held up the plates to the light. And what did he see? In the lawn of bacteria, he saw these little holes that we call plaques. And he thought, gosh, you know, that's strange. It almost looks like something's eating the bacteria, right? Mm, right? Isn't this fascinating? So, so he had discovered bacteria phages, bacteria eaters. And we now know, you guys, these bacteria eaters, bacteria phages, are viruses that infect and kill bacteria. It's weird to think, isn't it, you guys, that even bacteria suffer from viral infections? Yeah, so you guys, we use the terms interchangeably. So if we're talking about a bacterial virus, very often people won't say bacterial virus, they'll say phage, eater. And we just are supposed to know that's a bacterial virus. So these are synonymous, you guys. A bacteria, bacterial virus is the same thing as a bacteriophage. And Phage means to eat, and what are you eating? Bacteria. And again, folks, as biologists, you know how lazy we get? So often, we don't even include the bacteria. We just say phage. And if I say phage, you guys, what is it? You know right off the bat, what is it? It's a virus that infects bacteria. And you guys, this article, we, we all, I don't think we're going to get to this. But um, just, just so I won't forget, you guys, we're now seeing we can use bacteriophage to kill antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And they are having phenomenal results with this. So this is hope for us, OK? We'll come back to that. OK. And so, um, so it was proposed, you guys, he proposed maybe these bacteriophage could be used to kill bacterial pathogens. And you guys, did we have antibiotics back in World War I? No, right? That was to come later. Can you imagine life in general without antibiotics, and specifically fighting a war without antibiotics, right? Just devastating. So here again, we have the prepared mind to think about something smaller than a bacteria that could kill bacteria, and the prepared mind to think, could we use these little phages to kill bacterial pathogens in our patients? And it turns out he was right, and we'll come back to that. Okay. <clears throat> So you guys, in the, um, in the lawn of bacteria, the holes or the plaques, um, those were areas where the bacteria, viruses, bacteria phage, had infected the viruses, replicated, caused the bacteria to lice, and all the newly replicated phages attached to neighboring bacteria, replicate, cause them to lice, attach to neighboring bacteria, replicate, cause them to lice. And that's what makes those holes, those plaques, in the lawn of bacteria, classic for bacterial virus. Just, I know this isn't as exciting, you guys, but going fast forward, 1935 here in our backyard, UC Berkeley, Wendell Stanley, a biochemist, was able to crystallize the viruses causing tobacco mosaic disease. And that was bizarre, you guys, because you crystallize chemicals. You don't crystallize cells. What's going on here, right? So at that time, people thought viruses were just pure protein, right? But then a few years later, uh, a British... Um, scientists um, did, continued the studies and found out that the, um, the viruses were 95% protein, but there was a little bit of nucleic acid in there. And so at that time, then, they described the viruses as nucleoprotein, a combination of nucleic acid and protein. 
Now, why are we having such a hard time with these viruses? Because they're so little, right? We, we didn't have a powerful enough microscope to visualize them, right? So we had to wait for the electron microscope, right, to be able to visualize these little bacteria. And, and folks, the reason is the viral size range, this is, again, kind of a rough range, um, the smallest ones, like the poliovirus, is down around 20 nanometers. That's almost the size of a ribosome. And then some of the larger viruses, like the pox virus family, up around 300 to 400 nanometers. We could probably just barely see them with our light microscope. But you guys, in general, we're going to say for our exam that we would need an electron microscope to visualize most viruses. And folks, it took a long time developing. And part of the problem was, is that you know, now we're past World War One. Now we're getting ready for another war, right? World War Two, and the early development of the electron microscope developed in Germany, right? And eventually, we, the U.S. was at war with Germany. So it wasn't until um, 1939 at the RCA conference <coughs> here in the United States that the first electron microscope was developed, right? So it just took a long time, right, developing that electron microscope. And um, this was from a, a history book. You guys talking about? the, the um, use of this uh, electron microscope by the RCA company. And what they chose to do, they chose to try to visualize these little bacteria flowers, these little bacteria eaters. And so this was going to be the first electron micrograph you know, of a virus that was, um, that was developed. So they had this gathering of all these scientists right, waiting for this image to appear. And can you imagine, you guys, if you're one of those scientists waiting to see what a bacteria virus looks like, and this is the image. I mean, I would think, oh, these are out of space, alien invaders, right? Isn't this the most amazing um, image? So one of the one of the scientists there, Professor Herr Dr. J. J. Brockenbrenner, he says, My gosh, they've got tails, right? And 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 the thing is, you guys, as humans, when we see something new, we always are trying to connect it. What is this new thing? What does it look like to me? Right? And so hair professor Brenner thought they had tails, right? And indeed, you guys, we do call these the tails. It's just amazing. So some of the scientists say, you know, they're like, they look like sperm, right? They look like tadpoles. We're struggling, right? Trying to, what are these things, right? So, so you guys, we later on will be using the term um, T bacteriophage, and T just stands for type. It's just a certain family of bacteria viruses that the scientists agreed to study to try to, to speed up their understanding of what these viruses were. Okay. So, okay, so we'll do a little bit more history later, but that was like, like our first vis visualization of viruses. Just crazy. And so, after those first images were developed, you know, the journalists were really excited to interview. This is a brand new, almost like life form, right? Just as if space aliens had arrived here on Earth. So another of those scientists was being interviewed, and I love this quote, you guys. And so the journalist was asking uh, Professor Max Delbrook, you know, what is it like studying viruses? And he said, I love this, he goes. He says, studying bacterial viruses or bacteria is a fine playground for serious children to ask ambitious questions. And you guys, this is like, I seriously feel this way about science education is little kids, you guys are scientists. That's what you're doing your whole childhood long. You're doing experiments, trying to figure out how the world works. And then what do we do to you? We put you in science class, and we knock that enthusiasm out of you, right? We, 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 we kill your natural curiosity. So I just want to put a plug in there for you guys that um, never, never give up your imagination, right, and your curiosity. And certainly, you guys, if you have kids, try to keep it alive in them, right? Because we, we, we're going to really need ambitious, ch ambitious, curious adult children asking these ambitious questions to solve the problems in the future. So I just thought, man, I wish science education was different than what it is. Maybe you guys will make the difference. OK. So you guys, now, now, now I'm going to come back and just beat your enthusiasm out of you, right? So we have to do vocabulary. So, so folks, if you read your textbook, some textbooks will use two terms, virus and virion. I never use virion. I only use virus. But I just wanted to give you the definition. So a virus, these tiny infectious acellular agents um, contain nucleic acid surrounded by a proteinaceous capsular. That's just the protein coat, fancy name for the protein coat. 
Um, and again, so um, the nucleic acid is protected by this capsid. So a virion is a virus outside of a host cell. And this actually gets a little bit philosophical, you guys, because some people say, well, are viruses alive or not? And we had a wonderful biology professor here that also taught philosophy. And he said, well, it depends what the virus is doing. If the virus is inside a host cell and is replicating, that's a property of life. So he said you could argue a virus is alive if it's in a cell, but if it's outside of a cell, it can't replicate. It doesn't have any of the properties of life. So you could say you could argue a virus outside of a cell is not alive. And I thought that was a great philosophical answer. So you guys, officially then, a virus outside of a host cell is called a virion. I never use the term. I just use virus, 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 virus inside the cell, virus outside the cell, OK? And folks, here are some of the general characteristics of viruses. And of course, you might see some of these on lecture exam three. So um, a lot of this you guys know already. So are viruses made of cells? No, no they're acellular. Good. Can viruses synthesize cell membranes, cytoplasmic membranes, plasma membranes? No. no. I mean, right off the bat, we know they're not cells, right? Do viruses have their own ribosomes? No. no. How will viral proteins be made then? By the host ribosomes, that's right. Do viruses carry out metabolism? Can they make ATP, for example? No. Nope. So where are they going to get the ATP for, for uh, biosynthesis? From the host cell. Do, do viruses have both DNA and RNA like cells? No. Nope. One or the other. Yeah, one or the other. Excellent. One or the other. There you go. Do viruses get bigger like a cell and divide the two? No. Nope. So viruses, guys, the best definition was uh, Professor Jenna Meyer. Um, she said, viruses are assembled like you'd assemble a car or assemble a bicycle, right? They're assembled from parts, very different from how cells replicate. And folks, this is one that does confuse folks. So, so let me put it up on the board. Because depending on how I ask this on the lecture exam, it can cause confusion. OK, so you guys, this is a true statement. All viruses are what we call obligate intracellular pathogens or parasites. You can use either term. Meaning that viruses can only replicate when they are where? Inside a cell. That's what intracellular means, inside a cell, right? Okay, so you guys, is this true? All viruses are obligate intracellular pathogens. That is true, right? That, do you guys believe me? Okay, so this is true. This is the false statement. This is the false statement, guys. Okay, so let's put false. If we put only viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. And the reason this is false, you guys, is that there's other, even cellular organisms, cellular pathogens, that are obligate intracellular pathogens or parasites. There are some bacteria that can't replicate unless they're inside a host cell. So for this reason, you guys, this statement, only viruses are obligate intracellular parasites or pathogens, that's false because there's other microbes that likewise can only replicate inside a host cell. But you guys, all viruses, are all of them obligate intracellular parasites? Yes, that is correct. OK, good. And folks, um, any, any cellular organism can be infected by a virus. So I don't know if they know of any cellular organisms that can't potentially be infected by viruses. So folks, this was just a possible study guide in comparing viruses to cells. OK, and we'll, we'll be going over a lot of this in our virus unit, but just a possible study aid. And again, folks, kind of going back to why it took us so long to understand viruses, they're so darn on small. And I do like this, um, this diagram, you guys, because it gives us comparisons. So I, I think of a human mature red blood cell and erythrocyte, they have it here at 10,000 nanometers. I usually think of it like around um, 8 micrometers, which would be around 8,000. Um, nanometers. But again, just just give you an idea of relative size. So here's, say, a human red blood cell. Here's a typical bacterium, say E. coli, 
And generically, we say E. coli usually are about um, one micrometer in diameter, and maybe about three micrometers in length, right? So smaller than a red blood cell. But down here, you guys, there's these little tiny dot, 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 dot. What do you think those little dot, dot, dots are? Those are the viruses, right? So they're so little. So um, the virus size range, again, you guys, this is kind of general. 20 nanometers to 400. 20 nanometers is about the size of a ribosome. And again, you guys, 400 nanometers, like the box virus family, we could probably just barely make them out with our light microscope. Um, so again, you guys, sometimes, I wouldn't ask this on the exam, but sometimes this is just kind of fun. So the smallest virus is about 100 times smaller than a bacterium. And uh, smallest virus is 1,000 times smaller than a red blood cell. So again, if you guys, just the point here being that um, we're going to say for our exam that for most viruses, we need an electron microscope to visualize them. And you guys, what's the unit that we use to express the size of viruses? Nanometers. And you guys remember, a nanometer is 10 to the negative 9th meter. I mean, it's so tiny, so tiny, little itsy bitsy. And now we're just going to zoom in on those viruses, you guys. So uh, this, this, I like this, you guys. So the bacterial ribosomes are about 25 nanometers, and the polio virus around 30 nanometers. It is almost the size of a ribosome. That is how little, that's crazy. Size of a ribosome, right? And it can cause polio. What's with that? And then, folks, these are some examples of different bacteria virus. This is the one we're going to be talking about, bacteriophage. The T bacteriophage is so beautiful, right? But there are simpler ones. Almost, this looks almost like a polio virus, right? Here's one of the bigger viruses, you guys, the smallpox virus. Uh, the fox virus family has some of the biggest viruses. And again, we might just barely be able to make out a smallpox virus with our light microscope. And here's the tobacco mosaic virus, folks. So it's really long, but very thin, right? Really, really thin. So folks, now we're going to talk about general structure and function of the viruses. So our simplest um, virus, folks, would be just like how we started the lecture. So our simplest virus would contain viral genetic information, either DNA or RNA. And what's going to protect the viral genetic information? Yeah, yeah, good. That protein coat, the capsid. So you guys, so we're going to look at different types of viruses, and there's different ways we can group them. Different types of viruses. So the simplest one you guys is we're going to have, again, we'll use a squiggle. We'll use a squiggle here for the viral genetic information. And again, it's either DNA or RNA. And it's very fragile, you guys. So what do we have to build around it to, make, to protect it? Yeah, this protein coat, and we'll see you guys, the protein coats have different shapes. I'm just going to use this shape for now. This is the protein coat. What's the fancy name, you guys, for the protein coat? Capsid. Capsid, good. And folks, again, the protein coat have different shapes. We'll talk about the different shapes. Um, so in this cartoon, you guys, of the simplest virus, this is what we would call a naked virus. And naked viruses, you guys, the outermost layer is this protein coat. Now, folks, for a virus to um, invade a cell, they first have to attach to the cell. And this is very specific. So the surface of the virus, it has to have specific proteins. I'll make them really, really um, elaborate here. So these are little protein spikes. And these little protein spikes are going to be the adhesins. What does adhesin sound like? Adhesive tape to stick, right? And, and the key here, you guys, to viral infection, for a virus to infect a cell, step one is it has to bind very, usually very specifically, say this is a host cell, to bind, usually the viral adhesins have to bind to some specific host 
cell surface receptor. And this helps us understand the specificity of viral infection. Why is it some viruses will only infect a bacterial cell? Why will other viruses maybe only infect a dog cell? Or within us, you guys, why is it that some viruses, um, some might infect, say, our white blood cells, and other viruses will infect our hepatocytes, our liver cells? So a big part of it, you guys, is what kind of adhesins do the virus possess, and what kind of host cell surface receptors are there? If the virus doesn't have an adhesin to bind to the surface of the host cell, they can infect it, right? So this attachment is like step one and is really important. And you guys, again, why do they make this fancy vocabulary? I don't know. So when we talk about um, vir uh, virus attaching to a host cell, they came up with this fancy term called adsorption. So if you see viral adsorption, you, you guys, it just means attachment. Why don't they just say attachment? I don't know. But adsorption is attachment of the virus to the host cell. And we'll come back and talk about how our immune system has evolved ways to block attachment, right? So the virus can infect our cells. It's so cool. Okay. So you guys, the capsid then is made of these little protein subunits called capsomeres. Oh, and I brought this. This is an antivirus. You guys, it's falling apart. I saved it from the recycling bin. So you guys, so this is really cool. So this outside, this is all protein, you guys. So what is this outside? This is the capsid, right? And folks, you can have different proteins making up the capsid, right? And a lot of times those are going to be antigenic. They'll trigger an immune response. So here's our capsid. This is just one particular shape. It's falling apart. I'm using scotch tape to hold it together. Isn't that embarrassing? Okay. So this is actually what they call an icosahedral um, virus capsid. Don't need to worry about that, you guys. And then inside I have my what? What's this? Yeah, DNA or RNA, the viral genetic information. So this, folks, is called a naked virus, and the adhesins are going to be on the outside surface here. Okay, and we're going to find out these guys can remain infectious in the environment for long periods. Bad news for us. Good. Okay. So now, let, okay, let me not get ahead of myself here, you guys. All right, so we'll first talk about the different shapes of viruses, and we're, then we're going to talk about another type of virus. I'll put it up over here, you guys, called an envelope virus. So often the shape of the capsid is one of the, um, one of the clues as to identify an unknown virus. So you guys, um, in helical viruses like tobacco mosaic virus, the, the, um, the capsomeres, the capsids, they form this spiral protein um, helical structure around the nucleic acids, right? So they're called helical. The most common shape, you guys, are the polyhedral viruses. So it's kind of like a, a geodesic dome. The capsid forms like this geodesic dome around the nucleic acid. And the most common um, polyhedral is the icosahedral. And, and again, you guys don't need to know these details, but there's 20 triangular faces to this guy. This Don't worry about icosahedral. It's just a really common um, shape of the, the um, capsids. And then, folks, there's a third group where it's just kind of hard to say they're helical or they're polyhedral. Um, and we'll see with our bacteria you guys, this is actually a combination of polyhedral head and a helical tail, right? So they combine these different shapes. And then there's even more exotic viruses, you guys. And again, don't worry about this. The variola virus, it causes smallpox. It has this very bizarre shape. It's got these lateral bodies, and nobody seems to know what the lateral bodies do. The rabies virus, you guys, it's really cool. It's like a bullet. It's bullet shaped. I'm just imagining it you know, like a bullet going through your brain, causing all kinds of damage. Okay. And then, folks, just again, staying with the naked virus right now. So the genetic information we said could be DNA or RNA, and it could be double stranded or single stranded. It could be linear, or it could be um, circular, or if it's linear, it could be like multiple segments, like chromosomes, right? And again, folks, we just want to emphasize that the genetic information, it's so little compared to a cell. So if we take one of the smallest cells, you guys, the bacterium called chlamydia, the chromosome encodes information for a 1,000 gene products. So we'll, we'll pretend you guys 1,000 proteins. 
And in contrast, folks, the genome of one of the bacteriophage, it only includes information for three gene products, so say three proteins, right? So this is, this is how we come to understand why the viruses have to infect a cell. They just don't have enough genetic information to make things by themselves. And it, I love this picture, you guys. This is an um, E. coli, this electron micrograph. A single E. coli, you guys, what's all of this? Single chromosome, right? And up here, you guys, look, there's the bacteriophage nucleic acid. See how tiny it is, right? And that's why it has to parasitize cells to make everything for it. So, so um, again, you guys, classification is always a big deal. So before I give you this other concept, so if you discovered a new virus, the first thing I'm going to ask you, because I'm worried about mutation rates, is is it a DNA virus or an RNA virus, right? So what do we know about mutation rates, you guys, in DNA viruses? Relatively low, because DNA polymerases are copying the viral DNA, and we know DNA polymerase is proofread, so we're going to have a pretty low mutation rate there. In contrast, you guys, what, why do we worry about RNA viruses? High mutation rate. They use RNA polymerases to make viral RNA don't proofread, right? Really high mutation rate. So that's always of concern with a new virus. And then, folks, we're going to take this a step further. We're going to ask, is the virus naked? As we've drawn it here, right? So the outermost layer is protein. The adhesins are on that rough, resistant um, protein coat. Or, I'm going to introduce a new virus to you here, you guys. Is it an envelope virus? And the difference between naked and envelope viruses is how they escape from our cells. So what some viruses will do, you guys, is when they're replicating inside our cells, they're going to assemble inside our cell, and then they need to escape. So what some viruses do is when they escape, they steal some of our cell membrane when they escape. For example, they could, they could steal um, some of our cell membrane when they escape. And thus, they are, their outermost layer is stolen host cell membrane. And this, you guys, is my very expensive model of an envelope virus. <laughs> right? So you guys, if I ask you, what is the viral envelope, what is it? It's stolen host cell membrane. It could be cytoplasmic membrane. It could be nuclear membrane, endoplasmic reticulum membrane. Each virus, each envelope virus will steal, you know, a specific um, host cell membrane. Now, you guys, if you're an envelope virus, where must your adhesins be? On the envelope, right? Do you see my very expensive adhesins here, you guys, on the envelope? Okay, this is good news for us humans, you guys. So let's take a look at this. Here's our envelope virus. I'm going to take a naked virus, you guys, and I'm just going to, I'm going to coat it in what? What am I going to coat it in? Yeah, stolen host cell membrane. So that's the viral envelope. What is it? What's its origins? What's its origins? Where did it come from? Stolen host cell membrane. And you guys remember, cell membrane is very delicate, like olive oil, right? Very delicate, like olive oil. You guys, where are the adhesins going to be in an envelope virus? On the envelope. Now, this is awesome, you guys, because that means if we're infected with an envelope virus and we shed the envelope virus into the environment, Anything that damages the membrane makes the virus inactivated. It can no longer cause infection. It can't bind anymore. Drying, sunlight, soap, um, bleach, any of those things will damage the envelope. <clears throat> so you guys, this is the good news about envelope viruses. They don't remain infectious in the environment for long. And you guys, the only good news I know about HIV is what? It's enveloped. And consequently, you guys, if I have HIV right now and, like, say I bleed onto the countertop here, probably if the blood dries, 
Very soon afterwards, the HIV will be inactivated, right? They're, they're kind of wussy viruses. That's why they need like intimate contact or a blood or organ transplant. So HIV, it's enveloped. And as a consequence, it's not going to remain infectious in the environment for long. In contrast, you guys, what about naked viruses? What do you think about them? That protein coat's pretty tough, pretty resistant. So bad news, you guys, with naked viruses, once they're shed into the environment, they can remain infectious for long periods of time. And you guys, the one I always think of is poliovirus. Get shed in feces. Wherever the feces goes, the poliovirus goes, you know, naked, tough virus, so it can remain infectious in the environment for long periods of time, you know, especially if it contaminates water or food. Okay, is that enough, you guys? You're just like, just, okay, we can stop. <laughs> we can stop right now. All right. All right, so you guys, we'll stop there. Um, and then let me just see where we're at, kind of big picture wise. So, what we'll do is we'll give some examples of naked and envelope viruses. And then, you guys, what we'll do on what is today? Wednesday? Okay, Monday. Thanks, you guys. What we'll do is we'll do bacteriophage replication. And it's a great, great model, you guys, for the replication of human viruses. So we'll go through bacteriophage replication, then we'll go through human animal virus replication. All right, you guys, um, have a great weekend. I hope you can rest up. You guys, I'll try to get your lecture exam two scores posted this weekend. Okay, and you guys, with the 12 bonus points on the multiple choice section, the average across both Monday, Wednesday, and Tuesday, Thursday, the average was 80% on the multiple choice. And that's right where I want to see it, right, is 80%. So I know it was a hard exam, you guys. But don't be discouraged. Don't give up. You know, you just hang in there, right? We're almost finished, believe it or not, right? Okay. You know, our son has nonstop ear infections, and I think the problem is, this is the bad news I think. I think what's going on with a lot of kids is they're getting a biofilm. And that's why you treat with antibiotics, they seem to get better, and then two weeks later, it's back. So, um, I think, this, this is so tough, and it's something to talk with your doctor about. Now that I know what I know, the fact that we had our son on antibiotics for so much of his life, I, like our friends, yeah, 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 yeah. So our friends, our son's best friend when he was a little guy, her mom took a more holistic approach and she would treat her daughter's ear infections with